right, good morning. Can you believe we're two weeks away from Christmas? Hard to believe. We're just in summer, I think. Um, but it's here. Um, today we're going to do a Christmas message, but it's going to be a little different than your typical Christmas message. Um, so there'll be no Santa Claus, no reindeer, don't get worried about that, no elves. But uh, not even doing the story of Mary and Joseph, really, in the manger. But we're going back before that. We're going to do the Christmas story from the book of John. And most of the time when we, we look at the Christmas story, we look at one of the other Gospels and we see the manger scene and Mary and Joseph and Bethlehem. And today we're going to do something a little bit different. So we go back to John chapter 1, verses one through 14. And what we'll do, we'll first we'll just read the whole passage, and then we'll go back and, and break it down. So John 1, so this is the fourth gospel. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, so in the New Testament, the, the Bible's braced, broken up into an Old Testament, New Testament. The New Testament is like a new covenant, a new covenant that came with Jesus Christ coming to earth. And, um, and there are four gospels, and they're essentially the same story that are told by four different writers, but the book of John's a little different than the other three. And so the book of John really ties it back into um, how the gospel fits into God's narrative from the very beginning. And so that's why we look at, at John today. So beginning of verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <clears throat> he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Verse 8, he was not the light, but he came to witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Matthew and, and Luke, in their Gospels, they write about Jesus coming into the world, but they start with his birth as a, as a little baby. But John, you see, is going all the way back to the beginning. The beginning of creation. In fact, he doesn't even touch on the, the birth. He leaves that to the other gospel writers. He jumps right into uh, the, the ministry of Jesus starting in the very beginning. The manger scene's beautiful, but God speaks through John to show us the why behind it all. The bigger picture, if you will. In the beginning. It reminds us of Genesis 1-1, doesn't it? In the beginning. Jesus was there. The word, logos, a word uttered by a living voice, embodying a conception or an idea. And that's what Jesus does. He's called the word because he embodies God himself. He embodies God's word. He embodies the plan of God. He is everything. That's Jesus. The word was both with God and the word was God. Amazing to think about that. Jesus is separate from God the Father, and yet they're one. So here we see in this first verse the Trinity, or at least two persons of the Trinity right now, right? The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. In the beginning, the beginning of what? In the beginning of creation, in the beginning of whatever you want to call the beginning Jesus was already there. He had no starting point. He is eternal. He has always been. He will always be. He was not a created being. So that counters the false teaching of Islam, Jehovah's Witness, and so many others that would say that he was just a man. 
And guess what? He wasn't a man who became a god, contrary to false teachings of the Mormons. No, he has always existed. He has always been God. Verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, that's an interesting fact to ponder, right? So when you turn back to Genesis, God creating the world, it says nothing was made except for through Jesus. Every created thing was created by him and for him. So let's turn back to Genesis 1. And let's look at that creation story. We'll just look at the first three verses of the Bible. Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form. It was void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Imagine this happening. You see the Spirit of God, that third person of the Trinity, was over the deep. The word translated God in this passage is Elohim. It's plural. We think of God, one person God. No, it's plural. Plural God. God in three persons. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They were all part of this. The Spirit was hovering over the deep. Nothing was created apart from Jesus. So I believe he's the one actually speaking light into existence. It was God's will that this creation happened, but he's using Jesus. It's through Jesus that the creation is happening. I don't pretend to fully understand the concept of the Trinity, but it's very clear here that God is operating in three persons. Jesus was there in the very beginning, creating. Verse 4, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. Life here, the word is zoe. It's abundant life, the fullness of life, God's own life. Zoe life was in Jesus. And he was the light of men. Light, here's phos, P-H-O-S, brilliant, heavenly light. We get our words phosphorus or phosphorescent from it. Glowing, bright. It reminds me of a story, just a little sidetrack. Back in college, my buddy, uh, roommate Craig and I were out there four-wheeling in the, in the Colorado mountains and came over this hill and we saw these bright lights over the horizon. And they're just hovering there. And they were kind of going up and down and just hovering out. And my, my roommate's always looking for signs of aliens. And so he's, uh, he's like, UFOs! Like, there's no UFOs. Well, explain it then. What is it? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what it is, Craig, but it can't be UFOs. He's like, let's go get them. And uh, so we did. We, we took off after the UFOs. We, we going through all kinds of uh, back, back trails, and we came out on a road that we didn't recognize. We were going up into the mountains, and we were heading the right direction, but we lost sight of these things. And uh, it was very dark out there. And we came around this one mountain, and there we caught the UFOs. The, the lights were right there in front of us, bright as could be. It was daylight. All of a sudden, you could hear the sizzling of the light. We ran off the road, literally, and uh, into a field, stopped, looked up, like, what is this, you know, terrified, and then realized what had happened. We were downrange at Fort Carson, and there were tanks out there, and they had lit up the battlefield with these phosphorus parachute um, flares, and so the, the heat from the flares were causing the, the parachutes to lift up, and so they, they looked like they were kind of going up and down, right? So we understood it wasn't UFOs, it was phosphorus. But it was so bright, it went from pitch black to daylight, like that, right? And I think of Jesus coming into this dark world, and it's that kind of contrast. Jesus coming into the world, bringing light, irrepressible light. And John here is pointing to the fulfillment of Isaiah 9-2 where the prophet Isaiah wrote, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The word darkness here is scotia. It's darkness due to lack of light, which is really all darkness, right? <laughs> it's lack of light. It's associated with wickedness, 
of misery, of hell itself. That's what this darkness is associated with. But have you ever noticed that darkness never overcomes light? Think about the darkest room. If you walk in the darkest room and you shine a flashlight, is it too dark to see the flashlight? No. The light always breaks the darkness. The light can always be seen. The every corner may not be illuminated, but the light is visible. Everyone can see the light in the darkness. In fact, the darker it is, the brighter the light looks. And the fact is, we live in a dark, broken world, but we carry the light of the Lord with us, inside of us. Verse 6 says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And John came as a witness, to bear witness about the light that all may believe in him. Now, John was not the light, it says, but he came to bear witness about the light. And the writer here is not speaking of himself, this John, but he's speaking of John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. And John came as a witness to Christ. Think of a a witness in a judicial proceeding who testifies about Jesus. This is the coming Messiah. This is the one who was prophesied all those years ago. He is here. He has come. The prophecies are fulfilled. And the story of John the Baptist is told over in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 25. We'll just read a couple of verses of it. Um, Luke 1, 13. Um, and, and this is, Zechariah was a priest, and the angel Gabriel himself came down to Zechariah. And he says to Zechariah, do not be afraid, Zechariah. <laughs> sure. The angel Gabriel just appeared to him. Why would he be afraid? Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth, who was very old at the time, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And skipping ahead to verse 16, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. John would point the way to the Messiah, to Jesus, the Messiah that had been prophesied so many years before. Back in John 1, 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world. The world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. Jesus brings light to everyone. Notice that. Jesus is not stingy about his light, about his grace. He sheds his grace on the entire world. Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus loved the world. He sheds his light on the entire world, but the world didn't know him. He created the world and everything in it, but the world did not recognize its own creator. And this is largely true today. Maybe getting darker. Verse 11, he came to his own, his own people, Israel. He came to first, and his own people did not receive him. Now the prophets had foretold the coming of the Lord. And so there was really no excuse. It was not like they they didn't know the story. They memorized the Torah. They knew the prophets. They knew what was going to happen. Isaiah is even called the fifth gospel due to the many prophecies about Messiah. But they rejected him. See, they were expecting a ruling, conquering king. They wanted to get out from under Roman empire, Roman influence. They were looking for the king to come, lay out (laughs) you know justice and free them create a new kingdom and they were going to be in charge then that's what they wanted they had no idea or no no respect for a baby being born in a manger to two poor parents and living as a pauper and walking around homeless and being so peaceful and taking the 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 condemnation of the world on his shoulders that, that that's not what they were looking for in a king But that's what Jesus brought to them. But his birth, his rejection, were prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. Let's turn to a few of those passages. Uh, Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. This was written over 700 years before Jesus was born. Isaiah 9, 6. 
For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be on his shoulder, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. That's who's coming. Isaiah 53, 2 and 3. He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form, no majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was just a man. He was despised. He was rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. People didn't even see value in Jesus. He wasn't who they expected. Verse 12, though, says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of man, nor of the flesh, but of God. Born of God. This is speaking of the second birth, of being born again. And this this second birth is conditioned simply on receiving him and believing. Receiving Jesus, the free gift that he gives, believing in his name. It's really that simple. He has paid it all. He has paid the full price with his own blood shed on the cross for you and me. Believe it. Believe him and receive his free gift. Jesus would explain this this being born again a couple chapters later in John chapter 3. And if you remember, this Pharisee, Nicodemus, came to Jesus, and he starts this discussion, and Jesus kind of cuts him off. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For God so loved the world, skipping ahead to verse 16, that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world in order that the world might be saved through him. That was the purpose of Jesus from the very beginning, to save the world, not condemnation. Think about that. The world rejected him. The world did not know its own creator, and yet God still loved the the world so much that he sent his only son to offer salvation, a chance for redemption. In verse 14, the Word became flesh. Jesus, the pre-existent one who has always existed with God, the second member of the Godhead, he became flesh. He took on human flesh, human weakness. He dwelt among us. He suffered more than we could ever imagine. He took on every trial, every temptation that we could ever be faced with, and he defeated it. He conquered it. He lived a perfect, sin-free life. And in the end, he would voluntarily go to the cross and pay for the sins of the world with his own flesh and blood. (laughs) We've seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's this Jesus who's come. So takeaways here. Jesus is the Word, the embodiment of God the Father. If you look at the, we've been studying Hebrews in our life group, and Hebrews 1 is amazing. You've got to read that today. I just encourage you to read Hebrews 1. He reminds them of who Jesus is. Because they had walked away from Jesus, they had turned back to their old system. Hebrews was written to these, these Hebrew believers who had received Christ, and yet they had turned back to the old system, old system of religion, of sacrificial, sacrificial system, of, of trying to follow the, the Sabbath. And the writer reminds them of who Jesus is and who they've turned away from. Read that when you get a chance. Jesus had no beginning. He had no end. He's eternal. He's the light of the world. This bright, brilliant light of God brought into the darkness, the misery of hell. Jesus has come in. He came not to condemn, but to save. And he's still calling the lost and dying world to salvation, and he uses us. 
What a blessing we have as believers that he uses us. So how should we as Christians, um, how should we treat this holiday season? How should we respond to this Christmas season? And the, the worship team is going to come up and, and do another song. But I want to take a little, a little time to turn back to Christmas itself and why, why December 25th? What does that mean? Why do we celebrate Christmas at the end of December? The reality is it's unlikely that Jesus was born in December, okay? Um, the other gospel writers talk about that uh, the shepherds were out in the fields watching over their flocks. Well, that, that didn't typically happen in the middle of winter. That was more like what would happen in the spring, so probably like April to June time frame. Um, so why do we celebrate Christmas in December? And it's interesting if you go back to the history of how it all got started. Uh, Christmas was first celebrated in December in about 354 A.D. is the first uh, historical reference to it. Before that, for hundreds of years, the Roman Empire had celebrated this festival called Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a, a pagan festival, uh, a festival of lights, a festival where they gave gifts, where they gave things to the poor, where they freed slaves for a period of time. And it would typically last about a week long, and they would have great fun and get drunk and, and have a great time, and, and they would give each other candles as lights. The winter solstice is another um, kind of holiday celebration in many cultures. The winter solstice is that day, the shortest day of the year, the day of the longest night, the most darkness of the year is on the winter solstice. And so many cultures would have these celebrations around winter solstice about, um, I guess, probably to counter the depression that comes with it, but also to celebrate that, hey, the light's coming back, the light's getting longer. You can see some of the symbolism that Jesus is the ultimate light coming back, right? There's another um, holiday, if you will, in Roman times, Dies Natalis Solus Invicti, meaning the day of the birth of the unconquered son, because before Constantine, many of them celebrated and they worshiped the sun god. Constantine himself, the emperor of Rome, was raised up worshiping the sun god, and they would worship on December 25th, interestingly enough. But Constantine became a Christian in 312 AD, and he pushed the whole Roman Empire to take on Christianity. And so Rome, the Roman Empire, took these pagan holidays and basically rebranded them and said, don't focus on a sun god, don't focus on the darkness uh, of the winter solstice, don't focus on this, this pagan Saturnalia, focus on Jesus, God's own son. That's what we're going to celebrate instead during this time where everybody typically celebrates. And so they dedicated this holiday to the birth of Jesus. And I would argue that it's really not a bad thing, right? It's, it's taking something that the culture was doing and it's, it's refocusing the culture on Jesus, away from the pagan roots, focusing on the coming of Messiah. And in many ways, Christmas has returned back to its pagan roots. We see it all around us, right? In this Christmas season, there's this stress, this busyness, the materialism. But let us look for ways to show the world that no, Christmas is about Christ coming, his birth. Let's show the world the love of Christ. Second Corinthians, as the, as the worship team is going to come up, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says, For God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, has shown in our own hearts to give us light in the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure, this treasure of Jesus himself, the light of God. We have this in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We carry him with us. We bring his light into every dark room we enter, and the darkness cannot overcome the light. So I say Merry Christmas, and I think we ought to go out there and, and take on the culture. And when you hear anybody complaining about how stressful Christmas is, how much there is to do, how broke they are from all the gifts they bought, 
etc. Let's take the opportunity to share how we love Christmas because Christmas is about the birth of Christ, the light that came into a dark and dying world and that he came not to condemn but to save and he's still looking to do that. That's still the mission to save and he's doing it through us, bringing the light. Amen.